Let's begin by telling you that the federal government of Nigeria has unveiled a lineup of events to celebrate this year's Democracy Day. Details were announced in a notice issued by Abdul Hakim Adilye on behalf of the Director of Information and Public Relations in the Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation. The festivities will kick off on Tuesday, that's June 11th, with a symposium at the State House Conference Center Presidential Villa Abuja starting at 9 a.m. Later that evening, a youth conference will be held at the Ladi Kwali Hall, Abuja Continental Hotel, beginning at 6 p.m. On Wednesday, June 12th, the celebration will feature a grand parade at Eagle Square, Abuja, commencing at 8 a.m. The day will conclude with a dinner at the State House Banquet Hall, Presidential Villa Abuja, at 6 p.m. Now, the note is highlighted that only accredited villa correspondents will be allowed to cover the event at the presidential villa. In the meantime, President Bolame Tinubu has appointed Dr. Inkiruka Madueke as the Director General and the Chief Executive Officer of the National Council on Climate Change. The announcement was made in a State House press release on Sunday signed by the Special Advisor to the President of Media and Publicity, Ajurin Ganali. In addition to her new role, Dr. Madwekwe will serve as a co-chairperson of the Intergovernmental Committee on the National Carbon Market Activation Plan. The doctor brings extensive experience to the position, having previously served as Nigeria's National Coordinator for Climate Parliament a global network of legislators dedicated to addressing the climate crisis and promoting renewable energy. She also served as the legal advisor to the former Director General of the NCCC. This interim appointment is pending confirmation by the Supervisory Council of the NCCC. President Bola Metinubu has expanded the Presidential Committee on Climate Action and Green Economic Solutions, adding new members to bolster its efforts. Initially, the President named 26 members to the committee on May 19, 2024, with himself at the helm. However, a statement released on Sunday by Shegun Emoesin, Director of Information and Public Relations, announced additional members. The new appointments include representatives from the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning, the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Resources, that's gas, the Federal Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology, and the NMPCL. Additionally, Ms. Yasmin Mohammed, Special Assistant to the President on Energy Transition, and Mr. Sumkele Awa Kalu from the Energy Transition uh, Office has been added to the committee. The Green Economic Program, a United Nations initiative, aims to encourage and support investment in low-carbon development and green sectors. The inauguration of the expanded committee is set for July. Away from that, the parish priest of St. Thomas Catholic Church, Zaman Dabo Community in Zango Kataf, local government area of Kaduna State, Reverend Father Gabriel Uka has been kidnapped by bandits. He was said to have been abducted by the bandits in the early hours of Sunday. A statement by the Vicar General of the Confederate Catholic Diocese, Reverend Father Emmanuel Kazia, uh, solicits prayers for the immediate and safe release of the abducted priest. The Reverend Father commended the condemned the act of kidnappings for ransom of innocent and defenseless citizens of the communities and called on the government to hone its security intelligence as the country approaches the celebration of Salah. Troops and special forces of Operation Wild Punch conducting special fighting patrols at the Kachia Kujudu axis of Kaduna State have neutralized five bandits at Dantaru a general area of Kujuru, local government area of the state. This was disclosed in a statement issued on Sunday by the State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Aruan. About the troops' operations to clear the Maru Enugu access spanning Kachia and Kujuru local government areas. According to Aruan, the troops engaged the bandits at Dentaru community and after a sharp exchange of gunfire, five of the criminals were neutralized. The troops also recovered two AK-47 rifles, 
one locally fabricated submachine gun, nine AK-47 magazines, 250 rounds of 7.62 mm ammunition, two motorcycles and two handheld radio sets from the bandits. The FCT Police Command, in collaboration with special forces from the Guards Brigade, the DSS and the Hunters, successfully stormed bandits' hideouts as Commissioner of Police intensified coordinated operations in suspected bandit routes and camps. In a statement issued on Sunday by the FCT Police Public Relations Officer, Josephine Ade, she noted that acting on credible intelligence, the operation targeted kidnappers' camps in Gidan Dogo and Kweti Forest, located in Kaduna State near the FCT border on May 7, 2024. The operation led to the arrest of four suspects who confessed to being members of a notorious syndicate known as My One Million, responsible for numerous kidnappings and other serious crimes in the FCT and surrounding areas. During the coordinated raid, a shootout ensued between the bandits and security operatives resulting in the bandits fleeing and the successful rescue of kidnapped victims. The National Drug Law Enforcement Agency says its operatives have again intercepted another consignment of 175,000 bottles of opioids imported from India. This is coming barely a week after seizing a shipment of 175,000 bottles of codeine-based syrup at a Port Harcourt Ports complex in Orne River State. The two seizures, according to a statement by the NDLA spokesperson Femi Babafemi, followed earlier intelligence which made the agency request that the shipment be stepped down for 100% examination. He said the latest seizure of 875 cartons of codeine containing 175,000 bottles and weighing 26.250 kilograms was made during a joint examination by the NDLA Customs Service and also other security agencies. The container from India was en route CC C2C bonded terminal in Enugu, according to the agency. The Nigerian police force has addressed mounting concerns over the rising number of arrests targeting journalists in the country. This response comes amidst growing pushback surrounding perceived human rights violations and threats to freedom of expression in the country. Our new centrist Neomani provides more in this report. The arrest of journalists in part of Nigeria has raised concerns about press freedom in the country, according to human rights groups. Daniel Ujuku and Shegun Olatunji's detention most recently are a few of the many cases cited by the Nigerian Guild of Editors. The instrumentality of the Nigerian security apparatus is set loose on these individuals as soon as they express views unfavorable to the administration or in the case of journalists, as soon as they publish, as they publish credible stories that cast the administration in an unflaking light. The police is giving conditions, bail conditions as if Daniel Ojuku committed murder. We are bring two directors in the Federal Civil Service with landed property. How can you be a director in the Federal Civil Service and have landed property in Abuja if you are not corrupt? That's another oxymoron. In recent days, media organizations and rights groups have condemned the methods used to arrest journalists, the lengthy detentions and the inhumane treatment to which they are subjected. They said these actions showed a concerning regression in Nigeria's respect for human and civil rights. However, at the inaugural meeting of the Strategic Communications Interagency Advisory Policy Committee in Abuja, the police denied abducting any journalists and noted that inviting journalists is not a mandatory part of the arrest process. So I want to clear this, I clarify this, that we are not obliged to even sign the invitation to any suspect in court. It's just a mark of respect. We are sending to you. There's no law that says you must invite somebody before you carry on with your investigation. No. We can only honor you by saying, okay, let's extend the invitation to you. Let him come and explain. But where you don't honor invitation, we we'll go to court and get to warrant. Once we have that warrant, we can even declare you wanted. That's the law. We can declare you wanted and we can arrest you anywhere. The police actions continue to draw sharp criticism from media groups who state that arresting journalists without due process 
is unacceptable. We want this, a country where people are able to speak because freedom of expression is a guaranteed right for Nigerians. So we are able to speak truth to power in this kind of situation. But the interesting thing is that the CBN is using the amended Cybercrime Act to extort you. The police is using the old Cybercrime Act to oppress journalists. Nigeria has been ranked low in press freedom by organizations like Reporters Without Borders. Lamenting the situation, local and international organizations called on Nigerians to advocate against what they call an attempt to suppress freedom of expression and civil society. In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omoni. Ahead of the forthcoming Eid celebrations, prices of ram, one of the necessities for the celebration has skyrocketed in Nigeria's capital Abuja. Some citizens have expressed worry over the lack of resources to buy ram this year, which they say has risen to more than 100% of its former price. Now, New Central's marvelous Obom Malu tells us more. Every year, during the Islamic month of Doheja, Muslims around the world who have the means slaughter animals like sheep, goat, cow or camel to reflect the Prophet Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice his son Ismail to God. It may appear that this may not be the case this year for many Muslim families in Nigeria as the biting inflation has caused a hike in the price of livestock. New Central Crew visited one of the popular ram markets in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, to investigate this claim by some citizens. Here at the International Livestock Market, Day Day Abuja, Nigeria's capital, some of the ram sellers say they buy these livestock at Niger Republic, and now the high exchange rate of dollar and safer, coupled with the increase in fair products. Insecurity in the northern part of the country and cost of transportation are some of the contributing factors to this increased price of this particular livestock. Now, some of these livestock you are seeing here are sold 200, 300, 400,000 before now. But now it is going for 600, 700, 800,000, depending on the size you are buying, representing over a 100% increase. Just they rise up, dollar just they rise up. But we now, no be dollar we they use, we they use safer go buy them. Come now, safer to exchange now. No be small money, well, no be small money. Transport and the our money is not getting value like before. Our money doesn't have value yet again. So we people we are going to we are even enter Niger buying rams. The ram that we are selling three hundred. We, you are select, you are you are seeing big like this one. The last three years, uh, four years back, but now this is 800. This is one million. This one, one million. It's one million we are looking for. I came to buy the ram, and the cost they are giving us now is something I don't know how to express my something like last year. We could afford to buy this ram, maybe 120, 140. Before you see the ram, 35, 60, 50. Now, uncle, you go say 50, 150, 160, 180, 200, 250, 300, 400. Like this ram now, before we are selling this ram, 100,000, 110, 120 highs. Imagine now you go buy like this time 200, 220. Livestock sellers say this has been caused by the hike in the cost of feeds. Thus, the high cost of rams might deny some Muslim families the opportunity to take part in the annual sacrifice amidst the economic crunch. People are coming, price it and going. So if people come, price and so they will tell us say they will come back later or tomorrow. So at the end, they no go come. The current cost of rams now hover between 150 and 1 million naira, depending on the size and the location. In Abuja for News Central, I am Marvelous Obomman. The federal government may be on a coalition course with governors and the private sector for agreeing to pay a minimum wage higher than 60,000 naira. 
Nigerian governors and the organized private sector are against paying as high as 60,000 naira, as they insist that any figure above 57,000 naira may not be sustainable. However, everyday Nigerians are of a different view. New Central's Bettina Willie tells us more. A major argument by the governors, according to sources, is that the state will be left with nothing for developmental projects if they accept to pay a minimum wage above 57,000 naira, as they would have to pay a large chunk of their resources as wages to workers. I'm going to speak from the perspective of a salary inner, and I'm in, I'm in Nigeria, so I can see the economy very clearly that it is not something to write home about. Currently, CCK, I can't even say what, I can't, CCK is not, it's almost nothing at this point. It's not even, it's like 100k is a new 10k. I bet me government, me the everybody puts money, me the money increase, that's 200,000. But if you say in dollar, now they won't pay, me they pay in dollar. First of all, I have to commend the chairman or the president of the NLC. He has done a very good job for all Nigerians' workers. Secondly, the proposal of 250,000 naira from the NLC, it's a good one. And I stand to support it, and every meaningful Nigeria stands to support that. However, the negotiation for a new minimum wage is far from over, as the organized labor, as well as the federal government, continue to make offers and counter offers. Last Tuesday, the Nigeria Labor Congress, NLC, agreed to pause the strike for negotiations, giving the federal government one week to negotiate, after which the strike would continue if their demands are not met. Continuing the strike is actually not going to be a good solution because even though they continue and they still don't do the strike, the government will still take their decision. That's what I feel. So the strike, on, but still, if they still do the strike, it's still going to hurt because the, the cost of things now is so, so expensive in the market. I don't think they should accept the 62,000 because the country is hard. A lot has been happening. We, we that we, we, we run the business, like we are employing in a company, we are not getting anything like increasing our salary. And the chief fare is kind of crazy, you know. The government had initially proposed 48,000 naira and 54,000 naira last week, which were also rejected by the organized labor. It remains to be seen how much further the NLC are willing to push and how much more compromise the government is willing to make. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili. Let's also tell you that a group of traders in Plateau State have called on the state government to make the availability of conducive shopping structures for their daily transactions top priority. This call came when New Central's crew visited Taminus, the just main market, to see the level of compliance by traders whom government had relocated from the roads to a temporary place for transactions. According to the government, this development is for their safety as well as the beautification of the city center, especially within the just Bukuru metropolis. New Central's Jizuba Anyonwe tells us more. This is the popular Jasmine Market Terminus, which got burnt many years ago. Before the inferno, Terminus was a huge revenue earner, thereby improving the economy of Plato State. But now, this is what is left of it. A few weeks ago, Government Executive Order 3 caught up with some traders who moved their businesses to the roadside and under makeshift structures as against the warnings of government since last September. Those structures have been demolished and the traders ordered to temporarily relocate here, just beside the burnt market. This development still doesn't sit well with these traders who are back on the roads again. We know they have it because with the fire we're waiting children to go eat. And this thing can't happen like this. We're not gonna fight and we're not gonna call anybody. We see all of us here, they are only give us five shops. And the shop is not with us. They are not even show us the place yet. That's why. They will say they can't go inside. Some is even when crossing, they will see what they wanted to buy. So they will stay and buy. That's why we still here on the road. Despite the dangers associated with this kind of roadside transactions, this is what the affected traders have to say. 
that please we are calling the government in order to look into it they provide space for us but the space that they provide the head as in the people that they are in head of us are not giving us the space it's only when you know someone before they will give you space here or you paid money they never give us the place you go vacate so now i make everybody jam on the road now yes so if they give us the place you go stay we're not gonna stay here again this condition now, we, we spend more than 20 years here. We are selling market, and government said that we should park inside. We are about to park inside. They are there selling the place to others while they are not here. Behind me now is where government has temporarily relocated these traders for their safety and also for the beautification of the city centre. However, they still prefer, some of them actually still prefer to be on the roadside, saying that that is where their customers will easily locate them for their businesses. But how this pans out with the plans of government is what everybody is waiting patiently to see. From the Jasmine Market for New Central, Chizoba Anyoui. In a country like Nigeria, where opportunities are scarce, the big question is how many get to women? Now, questions like this have led to transformative and intensified actions to grant women access to education and representation in political spheres. Now, New Central's Chidima Ona shares more in this report. For decades, Nigerian women have faced challenges in achieving equal access to education and political participation. The lack of education has often limited their career opportunities and hindered their ability to advocate for themselves and their communities. However, the growing movement of feminism is pushing for change. Feminism just refers to equality of gender, uh, um, giving, uh, giving gender equal access to opportunities. That's just a simple form giving equal opportunities, so whereby both gender, uh, all genders, or whichever way you would like to classify that, have equal opportunities to social opportunities, economic opportunities, political opportunities. It starts from even school, educating the female children that it's not all about, fine, we're encouraging um, ch um, children, uh, female children now to be engineers and things like that, but Politics, we need to encourage female children to, you know, look at policies as future career prospects and things like that. Another important untapped area is that of legislation and policy making. As a country, it is vital to note that empowering women through education and political representation is fundamental to unlocking a brighter future for Nigerian women. For us to have gender caucuses or women caucuses or female caucuses, in the National Assembly, we have to first of all be elected as women. If women are not elected, how do you speak of caucuses? So it's very important for us to start talking about how women will be well represented by first of all start to advocate, campaign and converse. By having women visibly participating in uh, politics and uh, having more women representation, you could see that there are, there are concrete examples uh, across the world that where parliaments that have more women have changed the country in light of these pressing issues government initiatives and civil society programs are working to bridge the educational and legislative gaps by investing in girls education and encouraging women to run for office which creates a better nigeria where all citizens have equal opportunity to thrive nigeria's minister of information and national orientation has launched the nation's advanced audience and measurement system for the broadcast media and advertising industry. The minister says that the system will reposition the advertising subsector for accelerated growth and attracting immense financial returns and helping advertisers get more value for money. New Central's Amadun Oyi tells us more. It was the launch of Nigeria's audience measurement system for the broadcast industry. In attendance were media and advertising professionals and their counterparts from the creative industry. This milestone represents a significant leap forward in the country's media landscape and is a testament to our commitment to innovation, adaptability, and the enhancement of the media industry in general. 
the introduction of this sophisticated audience measurement system is a groundbreaking achievement that aligns with President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's vision for a more prosperous and technologically advanced Nigeria. They say Nigeria's advertising industry has remained stunted in view of a lack of data, which has continuously shortchanged Nigeria's broadcast sector when compared to other African countries. It is disheartening to know that in spite of having more than three times the eyeballs in South Africa, Nigeria's television advertising market revenue is low compared to that of South Africa and Kenya, as we are the third in the continent. If you are talking in terms of GDP, Nigeria has the highest GDP. In terms of population, Nigeria is over 200 million. Even the number of internet users in Nigeria, they are more than population of some other countries. Now, if you now look at advertising investment, we are not among the top four or top five. So why? It is a pity that India started 200 years ago. Nigeria is starting today. And that is the sad aspect of this whole situation. Nigeria's Minister of Information and National Orientation says that the measurement system will present a win-win situation for the country and the sector. This system will serve as a cornerstone, cornerstone for reliable data by providing accurate and comprehensive insights into media consumption patterns across various demographies. This system we are launching today holds immense importance in ensuring that our broadcasting endeavors are not only impactful, but also reflective of the diverse preferences and needs of our audience. It would address um, how preferences are made when advertising, where, where the revenue should go to, media consumption patterns, all of that. It will also address um, unethical practices that had hitherto plagued the um, industry. What we, the practitioners in the industry, are scrambling for is 500 million annually. Uh, we believe that by the end of 10 years, with return on investment being proven scientifically, we would grow this market to sub 10 billion in the next 10 years. That's our plan. The minister says that the audience measurement system will reposition the industry for accelerated growth. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Nigeria is said to be battling with an estimated 2.3 million children who lack access to or are never reached by routine immunization services. This category of children, also known as zero-dose children, is a source of concern according to the World Health Organization. In a concerted effort to eliminate the threat of zero-dose children in the country, the African Health Budget Network, in partnership with the Bornu State Primary Healthcare Development Board, is set to unveil a transformative initiative in Bornu State amidst concerns of resistance. Now, New Central's Umaru Kirawa tells us more. Gerba Abdu, an elderly person from Bornu State in Nigeria's northeast, he is one of the elderly who do not believe generally in immunization and opens up on reasons. <laughs> The joy of getting a child is a story in itself and ensuring the child receives the necessary vaccinations to protect them from preventable diseases is another story. The fight against zero-dose children in Borno State is the essence of this multi-stakeholder engagement with the launch of the Community of Practice on Immunization Budget Tracking, Accountability and Sustainability. This is a big issue that we need to come together as a community of practice and community of actors to ensure that we deal with this problem and we reduce the outbreak of vaccine-preventable diseases like diphtheria, measles that we keep dealing with.
all my children are fully vaccinated and there are so many other doctors nurses uh, that attended this program today and i'm sure they don't have that uh, aspect so we have to interact with the community, we have to interact with the policy makers, you know, we have to interact with the government officials to ensure that no stone is left unturned. This initiative, spearheaded by the African Health Budget Network, in partnership with the Borno State Primary Health Care Development Board, aims to champion the cause of eliminating zero-dose children. The whole primary health care is depending on what immunization. We are always talking about immunization and a lot of resources going to the LGA. Who are the LGAs? The community. So if you look at it, this is a very important uh, launching or this is a very important uh, topic to address our problems. Most of the misery cases that we are having, measles, diphtheria cases, are coming from the zero-dose children because the children are vulnerable. They have not been protected by any form of vaccines. So any other disease of under five usually tackles them first. When a lot of people don't take immunization, the herd immunity is reduced and then we put every other person at risk, even those that have taken the vaccine. We should be committed because this is a service to humanity and majority of us are used to this service for over two decades. Experts during the engagement emphasized the need for enhanced retraining to community health workers as a major step to improve immunization performance. When an objective is set, our intention is to ensure that we make it happen. So yes, true, we are going to bring down drastically. We are already bringing down the number of zero-dose children. The journey of changing the mindset and reducing the zero-dose children in both rural and urban communities seems to require more efforts in sensitization and advocacy among others. In Maiduguri for News Central, the death toll from a recent attack by a suspected Islamic rebels in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has tragically risen to 41. The update was provided by Congolese Army spokesperson, who disclosed that the attack carried out on Friday was the work of the Allied Democratic Forces, a militant group now based in Eastern Congo. The ADF, which has pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, frequently launches attack, further destabilizing an already volatile region populated by numerous militant groups. Originally from neighboring Uganda, the ADF is also suspected of being behind another assault earlier this week that claimed at least 16 lives. This surge in violence highlights the urgent need for enhanced security measures and greater support for the affected communities in eastern Congo. Let's also tell you that Somalia's government says five of its soldiers died in a battle with Al-Shabaab insurgents on Saturday. The government says nearly 50 Al-Shabaab fighters were killed in the battle about 350 kilometers north of the capital Mogadishu. The government troops and supporting militia forces got word of an attack planned by Al-Shabaab in the region and set an ambush according to a uh, statement. Now, they said airstrikes were also carried out against the Al-Shabaab forces. Al-Shabaab has been waging a deadly insurgency against the fragile central government in Mogadishu for more than 16 years. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi was sworn in on Sunday for a third term after worse-than-expected election results left him reliant on coalition partners to govern. Modi, flanked by officials from the Hindu Nationalist Party and leaders of his coalition members, vowed in a ceremony marking his formal assumption of power to bear true allegiance to the Constitution of India. Modi's Hindu Nationalist BJP ruled outright for the past decade, but failed to repeat its previous two landslide wins this time round, defying analyst expectation and exit polls. It was instead forced into quick fire talks with the National Democratic Alliance, a 15-member coalition to gather the parliamentary numbers needed to govern. And in the world of sports, the Super Eagles of Nigeria have competed or completed their first training session in Abidjan ahead of their crucial World Cup qualifier against the Cheetahs of Benin Republic. Set for Monday, the team landed in Abidjan around 12.15 p.m. local time, cleared immigration and headed to their hotel.
they, were, they will be playing at the state Felix Hubert uh, in venue where they previously enjoyed success during the Africa Cup of Nations in Cote d'Ivoire. Coach Finidi George and Captain Wilfred Indidi excluded comf ex exuded confidence during the pre-match press conference ahead of the game. The team wants to win. Uh, the team wants to win. We also want to win. Um, what happened um, at the AFCON doesn't count, you know, this time around. This is World Cup qualifiers. Uh, the mentality uh, must be different. So, uh, we will approach the game uh, with every seriousness and uh, see how we can win. They want to win as well. So, tomorrow is the day. I think uh, they just won their last match and uh, the morale is going to be very high. Staying with sports, the Eagles are now gearing up for the encounter with the Cheetahs, coached by former Super Eagles manager Gennett Rohr, who left his position with Nigeria in 2021. Speaking at a pre-match press conference, Rohr reminisced about his time with the Nigerian team and also tipped them as favorites to advance. Of the medical staff, of the administrative staff, and so it's always a good thing to see somebody uh, you worked with and uh, you had good relations. We had uh, a wonderful time together. We qualified for everything what we could do and uh, there's no regret. I think it was even a record, five years and four months. <laughs> Nobody could do it before, so I'm proud of it. And I'm happy to see some players who could I bring in the team again. And uh, I remember that in 2018, in the World Cup, we had the youngest team in the World Cup, 23 years average. So I'm happy to see them still here in this team. I know that some of them are not here. Ekong, Osimhen, Simon Moses, and, but they are still very good players and some new players, which I couldn't have yet, and I think... Uh, our correspondent, Favour Itua, is live in Abidjan to provide more updates. Now, Favour, can you bring us up to speed with the latest development in the camp? All right, uh, good evening to you, Dako. Uh, for the Super Eagles of Nigeria, they did, of course, had their only training session uh, before the uh, game tomorrow against uh, the uh, squirrels or rather the cheetahs of Benin Republic. Now, the team took to the Felicio Febuani Stadium. They had to, uh, first of all, uh, they, uh, they went through the process of having their press conference. And from the press conference, they went to the pitch and they were able to shake up, uh, you know, that uh, stress from their body, go, went all the way. They had um, a prep talk before the training started. And after which uh, they started playing, uh, you know, like a five-a-side. They had some stretches. They were able to also uh, endure the rain because it was raining very heavily right here in Abidjan. So it means that we might have some rain during the game by 5 p.m. Nigerian time. So they were able to also uh, train in that particular condition. Uh, it was not really much of, uh, uh, you know, a training because, of course, it lasted for about uh, 25 minutes. 15 minutes was open to the press for them to see what they were able to do. And after which, of course, they went into their bus and straight to the hotel. Don't forget, for the away side, they don't have the privilege as the home side when they have to, you know, come into a game. The home side have been training for the past few days in that same pitch. But for Nigeria, they had only one opportunity, which was, of course, today, uh, you know, to train on that particular turf. Uh, so I, I think for Fidi, with what he said at the press conference, he knows the importance of this game. He knows that Nigeria needs to win that particular game because uh, so far, so good, it's been three draws for the Super Eagles of Nigeria. So we're looking forward to, you know, the very best of performance for the Super Eagles. And he did say that he wants to replicate the second half performance against South Africa in the game against the Republic. So we're expecting to see a change, not a total change Super Eagles side, but at least we'll get to see players who are more hungry to deliver on the day. But then against a team that the coach has coached Nigeria before for five years and four months, it promises to be very, very, very exciting and tough. For Finidi George, who is working in the tightrope, having you know had the draw in his first competitive match for the Super Eagles of Nigeria.
I think I'd like to pick up from where you stopped, talking about Gannett Raw. Now, how much of a threat uh, will you say the Nigerian Super Eagles is uh, looking at, given the fact that um, Gannett Raw uh, was actually the former coach? He understands uh, the players, or many of the players well, in terms of tactics and strategy and all of that. I mean, uh, how much of, 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 of a threat is there, if at all any? Well, a big threat uh, to the Super Eagles of Nigeria. Don't forget, majority of the players right now in the Super Eagles, uh, he gave them opportunity to play in the team. The likes of uh, Wilfred Onye, Didi, you talk about, uh, you know, Trus Ekong, you talk about Leon Balogo, some of the players in the team, or even most of the players, not just about some of the players, he gave them that debut in the national team. So he knows them very well. The last World Cup he took Nigeria to, so the 2018 World Cup in Russia, Majority of the players, he groomed them. They were an average of 23, 24 years. Now some of them are even hitting 28, 29, 30. And, uh, you know, he knows the position of the player. When he was asked about how he's going to cage Ademola Lukman, he said he was not going to, uh, you know, put his players all around Lukman. He's going to do a qualitative kind of defending. You know, mm. not having to put a lot of attention on him. But then his players will also keep an eye on him. And also, don't forget the Better Republic side. Majority of them are young. They are in the 20, uh, 25, 26. Uh, so you can expect to see more of adrenaline, more of power, more of, you know, pace from the, from, from the Better Republic side. But then, uh, Kenotro is one man we should not take for granted. He, every time he came to Nigeria or to coach, he, did, he, he has delivered in terms of qualification. He qualified Nigeria to the World Cup, qualified also to the Nations Cup, and he'll be looking forward to... Uh, do it once again for better republic but he did say that nigeria remains the favorite to qualify for the world cup i mean talking about being diplomatic but uh, we wish uh, super eagles all the best thank you for your time on the news favor and of course that's a wrap on the news at this time but before we go let's take a look at some of our top stories we told you that nigerian government has unveiled lineup for democracy day celebration we also told you that livestock seller lament high cost fear low patronage ahead of the Eid celebration. And finally, we told you that DR Congo's rebel attack death toll has risen to 41, unfortunately. Well, uh, don't forget to send in your eyewitness report to the number on the screen. You can also follow us across our social media platforms. We remain at New Central TV. You can watch us live. Across these platforms too, that's DSTV Channel 422 Star Times, Channel 274, Apple TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Dakbo Adigbui. Good night.